Good morning, everybody. It's wonderful seeing everybody out, and we're getting some of those people who have been out sick back with us. As I can see, some of the spots are starting to fill back in in the pews, and it's that time of year, right? I mean, everybody, the flus are going around, and COVID's still going around, but at least it's a much more mild uh, COVID than it used to be. Karen, Bill, I'm glad you guys are feeling better. I know you've had a couple, rough couple weeks there, so uh, it's great to see people starting to get back to worshiping the Lord, doing what they love to do, amen? If you look on the screen behind me this morning, we're going to talk about modesty and appropriateness. And I say, you say, well, I thought we were going to talk a little bit more about Daniel. Well, we were going to do a few more sermons on Daniel, but uh, on Wednesday, I asked, I was like kind of karaoke. I said, hey, I take requests. I'm teaching on Wednesday. What do you guys want to hear about? And Pat Dan said, he goes, I wouldn't mind hearing uh, something from the book of Daniel. So starting on Wednesday, instead of preaching on Daniel, we're going to start covering Daniel, going through those 12 chapters. And especially those last six chapters as we get to the various uh, visions and interpretations. That would be a good class. So starting this Wednesday, we'll be jumping into Daniel. I want to thank Zachariah for doing what he did this morning at the table. He did a wonderful job. So Zachariah, thank you. It's great seeing Zachariah and the rest of our young men uh, passing the emblems and seeing them getting involved in, in in the worship service. Seeing Chuck back since March, first time since March. I don't think I realized it's been that long. But uh, since March, having him back up here singing, he always does a wonderful job. Even Chuck, when you talk to him, well, I can't do it like I used to do it. You're still 100 times better than me and, and many of us. So, so you do, do a great job each and every time. But this morning, we're going to talk about modesty and appropriateness. And it's going to be probably a little bit different than some of our uh, other lessons in years gone by on modesty. Because oftentimes, I don't really hear much talk, talk about appropriateness. And so modesty and appropriateness, what is it? How can we uh, look at this? Because you have to understand that modesty is much more than just something that causes something, somebody to lust. I mean, you could have modesty of dress, modesty of behavior, modesty of speech. I mean, there's various forms of modesty. And so we're going to kind of look at it here this morning, and we're going to kind of start by opening up to John chapter 21 and verse 7. I'm not going to have this on the screen behind me, but the first idea that I'm going to look at in Scripture, we find it there. Because we have to understand, brethren, how, how long does it take before you leave your house or after you leave your house, uh, do you find somebody who's inappropriately or inadequately dressed? I mean, it doesn't take very long once you leave your home to run into those, whether sometimes in the church, I hate to say, but even outside of the church that are inadequately or inappropriately dressed. And that's something that I want to focus on here this morning because it's become, well, it's become a pandemic, if you will. It's become a real problem because I really don't believe that there are enough people who understand what God's standard is for modesty. What God's standard is for appropriateness. And we're going to look at uh, our first example here this morning, by the way, of John chapter 21. You know, you get to this part of John chapter 21, and we see that, uh, who was it? James and John, Peter, Nathaniel, uh, Thomas, like I think it says two more that were unnamed are there. And this is after Jesus' death, his, after his resurrection. He hasn't ascended yet. And all of a sudden, uh, the guys, you know, it was, it was, it was getting close to his ascension. And Jesus was going to meet up one more time with them, and, and he was going to have a meal with them, but they didn't know this yet. And so these guys are like, you know what, let's go out fishing. And because, well, that's what they do, they're fishermen, right? And so they really haven't had their marching orders yet to go, and so they're, they're still waiting for Acts chapter 2 to happen. And, and so they decide to go fishing, they fish all night. And it's just one of those nights. You guys know we've talked about this in the past before. Who's ever gone fishing? It's just been one of those days, right? It don't matter how many times you cast it in, don't matter what bait you use, what lure you use, you, you just ain't catching nothing, right? The fish ain't biting. And so they're out there all night, and then morning comes about, and there's this, there's this man who walks down the shore of the Sea of Tiberias, which is also Galilee, depending on uh, what you want to call it. But Jesus decides to walk down the, the shore of Galilee, and he yells out to his children. He says, my children, have you caught anything? And they said, no, we haven't caught anything. He says, do me a favor, cast it down on the right side of the boat, you'll, catch it, you'll, you'll get a catch. They cast the net on the right side of the boat, and they get a great catch. One of the best catches they've ever had a fish. And all of a sudden, what do we see there in John chapter one, uh, 21 and verse 7? Notice that it says, Therefore, that disciple uh, whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It's the Lord. And so when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, and for he had, for he had stripped for work, and he threw himself into the sea. 
And I love this example here because as we're talking about modesty and we're talking about appropriateness, I want you guys to keep that in your mind. Modesty, appropriateness. While, simil while there are similarities, not necessarily one and the same. And so it says that he threw himself in the sea. And you say, why would he do that? He's in a boat. He could have just rode his little butt in. But no, that's not what he decided to do. He jumps in the water. They said he's about 100 yards out. And he starts to swim. And he's, he's, he's going there. But I want, you to, I want you to see something here in verse, uh, verse 7 that I wonder if you've ever even noticed. In verse 7 of chapter 21, what does it say? Let's read that again. Therefore the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. So Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, and he did what? What does it say? He put on his outer garment. He put on his clothes. Why? Because he was stripped for work, and he threw himself into the sea. Well, brethren, isn't that a little bit of an odd thing to do? Isn't that an odd thing to do when you're in the company of other men? I mean, today we would think it's an odd thing to do, but not necessarily 2,000 years ago. Because you have to remember to remove your outer garment unless you were in times of work and you were only in your tunic, your undergarments, you were considered naked. And so it, was, it would have brought shame upon him. And so, brethren, you look at this, this example here in John chapter 21, verse 7. He swims 100 yards. But if you look at the original Greek word, and if you go back and even in the King James Version, if some of you have it here, it says the fisher's cloak. Well, what was the fisher's cloak? Well, the fisher's cloak was very similar to, you guys ever uh, see somebody wear an overcoat? We still have some uh, guys who wear the overcoats. Most of the time, it's a generational thing. But some of the guys still wear a uh, uh, an overcoat, don't they? It would be like one of us getting uh, in the boat, you throw on your overcoat, and you dive in the water and you swim to shore. That would, be, that would really be just a weird thing to do, wouldn't it? And so, brethren, when I, the reason why I bring this up, it's because it would be like, as we think about modesty, we think about appropriateness. How often do we in the church and we outside of the church, they think of modesty only in the form of lust, right? Most people think that if somebody dresses in a way that causes another person to lust, that it's immodest. And well, certainly that is true, but brethren, that's not, that's not enough. And so the question that I have for you here this morning is, how many of us want to put ourselves in a position of saying, well, Peter must have put on his outer garment because when he go to met the Lord, he was afraid Jesus Christ was going to lust after him. <coughs> but I mean, oftentimes, isn't that what we think about when we talk about modesty? We talk about dress. <coughs> Did, was Peter in fear that the Christ was going to lust after him? Rather, I, I, would, I would contend that nobody would, would ever even, that wouldn't even cross your mind. So think about that. There had to be another reason that Peter had put on his outer garments before he went to meet Jesus. Peter was going into the presence of Jesus Christ and he realized dress just in his undergarments was not appropriate. It was not appropriate and so thus he put on his outer garment as he swam to shore in order to meet the Lord. For brethren, why was it removed in the first place? Because it, while they were working all night long, sweating, straining with the boat, with the waves, with the nets, it wasn't like they were just fishing with the pole. They were working with the fishing nets. And it was a lot of physical labor that was involved. And so they, many of the fishermen, they removed their outer garment because you have to understand how were they dressed. Back in the first century, they would have had a loincloth. And a loincloth was basically almost like you could say a modern day short skirt. It was a loincloth. It was made out of linen. It went from the hips to just below the, uh, the thighs, which would be just above the knee. And then you had your tunic that was over that, that was usually a sleeveless garment, and that basically was like a shirt, like a, like a long linen shirt that went over the shoulders and down to maybe a little bit past the knees, maybe about mid-calf. And then there was an outer garment that was removed, and the outer garment was also known as a mantle or a cloak, and that was actually something that was put on like a robe, and that was removed in order to work. And so he goes and he puts on his cloak, his fisher's coat, he dives into the water to meet the Lord. Why? Because it was inappropriate for him to go into the presence of the Lord or any other individual in public when he wasn't fully dressed. And so, brethren, the reason that Peter did this is because modesty just doesn't govern the area of causing lust. 
It has to do with appropriateness. It has to do with being proper. And now we need to really understand that while modesty and appropriateness are related, they're not necessarily one and the same thing. And we will see that as we kind of develop this lesson. And I just want you to know that I'm going to cut this lesson short because it's literally already 1125 and I'm not even like into the opening yet. So I'm not sure what happened to the time here this morning. Chuck, how many songs did you sing? And so, you know, this is going to be, this is a longer lesson anyways. And so we're going to cut it short. We're going to do about half the lesson here today. So it's going to be a little bit more than 1130. So let the women know downstairs. It smells good. But but brethren, think about it. This story doesn't start in John chapter 21. This story starts in Genesis. Open your Bibles to the book of Genesis. I'll have it on the screen behind me as well. But this story doesn't start in John chapter 21. It starts in Genesis chapter 2. And because you see, brethren, as you're opening your Bibles, and I know some of you are going to follow along on the screen behind me, we're going to get to Genesis chapter 2. We're going to notice something about Adam and Eve. <coughs> and then right after that, we're going to look at the next chapter in chapter 3. In Genesis chapter 2, starting in verse 21, notice what this says. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and he slept, and he took one of the ribs and closed up the flesh at that place. And the Lord God fashioned into a woman the rib in which he had taken, and he brought her to the man. And the man said, This is now bone of my bones, this is now flesh of my flesh. We shall call, the, we shall call her woman, because she was taken out of man. And for this very reason, a man shall leave his mother and his father and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. But verse 25 is the verse I want you to notice. In verse 25, it says, and the man and his wife were what? It says they were naked, but it also says they were not ashamed. Now I want you to turn to the very next chapter, and I want you to look at chapter 3, verse 7 through 10. Because something happens here. They, they, then the eyes of both of them were opened. And they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together, and they made for themselves loin coverings. They heard the sound of the Lord walking in the, in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and, the, and, and his wife, it says they hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the very garden. And the Lord God called out to them, and he said to them, where are you? As if he didn't know. That's a rhetorical question. And so he says, he said, uh, Adam hears him. He says, I heard the sound of you walking in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. Brothers and sisters, think about that for a second. Something significant must have happened between chapter 2 and chapter 3. Because in chapter 2, they're naked, they're unashamed, they're walking in the cool of the garden with the Lord. And then chapter 3 comes, they're still naked, and all of a sudden they're ashamed. Well, what had happened? Oh, that's right. They ate of the forbidden fruit. They broke the one rule that they had, and they ate of the fruit of the tree, of, of the knowledge of good and evil. And now they understood that because of this new knowledge, this new information that they have, that the way that they were dressed was inappropriate. You see, brethren, now we need to remember before we even go any further with Adam and Eve. How many people were on earth at the time? There was two people. It was Adam and Eve. And so remember, this isn't always a lust thing, right? Because who were they afraid was going to lust after them? There was no other people on the planet at that time. And so you think about that. Scripture plainly says that Eve was the mother of all living, Genesis chapter 3 and verse 20. So we know there was no other people yet on this earth. And Adam and Eve were alone as far as people were concerned. And they had come into the understanding that just walking around on a daily basis without clothing on would be considered inappropriate because of who they were in the garden with. Who were they in the garden with? Jehovah. They were in the garden with God himself, almighty God. You know, God, it's not like God you know, uh, struck up a residence and he wasn't there all the time. But they knew that it was to be in the presence of the Lord would be inappropriate, being naked. They knew it had to do with shame, uh, shamefulness. They, had to, they knew that now with the new knowledge of good and evil, that being naked was shameful. And so in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 7, we learn that the eyes of both of them were open. And what did they do? What's the first thing they thought to do with the newfound knowledge they have? I need to figure out something. Because I'm naked, and I'm ashamed, and I don't want to be naked and ashamed. And so they got some fig leaves, and they sewed them together, and they made a loin covering. To do what? To cover their private parts. And they make this loin covering that covers the genital area. Today we would call that a speedo. That's essentially what the fig leaves were. It was a speedo. 
But by today's moral worldly standards, they probably could have appeared out in public in their nakedness, if you will, because even though they had some form of covering in their minds, they were still what? They were still naked. But they had some partial covering on. And yet, in the world that we live in today, they probably would have been perfectly fine. They probably could have paraded themselves across our TV screens, and nobody would have even thought about it. You know how I know this? This past week, I like Fox News. You could watch whatever you want, but I like Fox News. And I'm flipping through, you know, and I'm reading the various articles. And there's an article about Jennifer Lawrence. Jennifer Lawrence has this new movie. It's called No Hard Feelings. And in this movie about no hard feelings, it's about this woman. It's a, it's a comedy. It's only rated R, uh, not even mature or 17 plus. It's only rated R. And it says that Jennifer Lawrence uh, uh, had a scene where she was full frontal nudity. Full frontal nudity. And she took this young man, 19 years old, because the parents try to get her to date her son, because he's going off to college. And this is what the article says. I didn't see it. And so she, you know, she, he's going to help him to become more comfortable with women. They go to the beach and they decide to skinny dip. Well, other teens come along, steal their clothes. She runs out of the thing and, and starts to fight one of the kids that were stealing clothes. Completely nude. I'm pretty sure that Adam and Eve could have walked up here in their fig leaves and probably people wouldn't have thought a whole lot more about it. You see, brethren, this is not the first time this happened on TV. And so the article goes to talk about other actresses, Demi Moore and Margot Robbie, and how this is becoming a more uh, 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 common occurrence in our modern day television. So brethren, you think about this. I tell you that A, to warn you, but, to, but B, to let you know that we have lost the, the ability to be shamed. We have lost shamefulness is no longer a part of our, uh, of, our, of our makeup in society here in America. But brethren, you also need to focus on in this lesson that Adam and Eve were covered in some fashion, and yet when God said, where are you? He said, I hid myself because I was naked. And he was afraid. He was ashamed. He felt guilt. Do we still have that same feeling of shame, shamefulness? Guilt? You see, brethren, the first thing that we need to take, uh, to take into account in this lesson is that a man and a woman can be somewhat covered and yet still be considered naked according to biblical standards. You see, this is not a societal standard. This is God's standard. God says that you can be still partially covered and yet still naked in his eyes. And we know that because when we think about the account of Adam and Eve, most of the time we only focus on the sin of rebellion. We only focus on the fact that they eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and thus they sin and they get booted out of the garden. Not very often do we consider the fact that they were naked and they were ashamed. And so, brothers and sisters, we don't pay much attention to that fact. And, and the idea is that having acquired the knowledge of good and evil, they experienced guilt because of their immodesty. Due to their sin, they suddenly found themselves living in a world where nakedness was immodest. It means it was inappropriate via God's standard. And brethren, we still live in that same world today. Nakedness is immodest, and you don't have to be totally nude to be considered naked by God. Immodesty dominates much of what we see on television today, does it not? You can uh, turn on your music videos, your commercials, your regular TV shows. There's a constant flow of inappropriateness, immodesty that's coming into our homes, that's becoming the norm. That nowadays people are not wondering what God's standard is. They're just trying to be culturally appropriate. And if something is considered culturally appropriate, then they think, well then, that must be fine. Because I'm not dressed any different than maybe others are in a similar situation. But are we to live by God's standards or are we to live by societal standards? You see, brethren, we're Christians. We are, we are the disciples of Christ. We are to be a reflection of God, Christ Jesus, ourselves. And if we have a different standard for modesty and appropriateness than God does, where does that put us? You remember what Zechariah just said about hypocrites and why people can consider Christians hypocrites and so what he said goes very true to what I'm saying here this morning and so brothers and sisters <clears throat> we think about immodesty and we think about the idea that it's not just something uh, that we wear immodesty is expressed in the way we move there's immodesty inappropriateness in the way people dance is there not 
in the way we move, in the way we act, in the way we interact, the way we, the way we talk, and in the way we present ourselves. It'd be considered modest or immodest. Modesty is far-reaching. It goes way beyond apparel. Everybody wants to focus on apparel. Everybody wants to focus on lust. And yet, I'm pretty sure Peter wasn't worried about Christ Jesus lusting after him when he swam to the shore, but he first put on his outer garments. You see, brother, I'm pretty sure that Adam and Eve weren't worried about God, Father, lusting after them when they were afraid and hid themselves in the garden. No, they hid themselves because they were ashamed because they knew that they were dressed inappropriately. You see, it's entirely possible to be modest, modestly dressed and yet still act immodestly. And so how does a Christian remain modest in an immodest world? Well, first and foremost, we need to know what immodest and modest is. And the second thing is we must know what God's standard is. God's standard, God certainly did not command modesty, but left us with no way to know what modesty is. That would just be ludicrous. God has always made it known to his people what the expectation is, what the guideline is, what the standard is. Amen? And we have to read the Bible to understand what that expectation, guideline, and standard is. God, brethren, he's always done that. God, going all the way back to Adam and Eve, we see that in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 21, it says he made coats of skins and he covered them. And now keep in mind that God had the same clothes for Adam as he had for Eve, did he not? The same idea of appropriateness was both for the man and the woman. And so we need to consider that while at the same time remembering that the world thinks that a man can wear less and still be considered appropriate. And we're going to see what that means here in a minute. Why would God have created the coats of skin? Why would he have created the coats of skin if it doesn't really matter? They could have just continued on in their fig leaves. But he made coats of skin, and the coats of skin went from the shoulders to the top of the knees. And he made it for both man and woman. But yet society says that a man can walk around just in his, tr in his trunks, and all of a sudden, he could go out into the, he could go out in public, he could have his shirt off, and it's perfectly fine. But you know what God would say? He says, you're naked. And you have no shame. You see, brethren, we look at this, and I know some of you say, oh, that prudish preacher. <laughs> but is it a prudish preacher, or is it God's standard? Would you choose, do you choose to rather line yourself with the world and cultural acceptability? Or do you choose to line yourself with God? You know, you can call it whatever you want, but the facts are the facts. God, he actually, his divine standard created coats of skin that went from the, the shoulder to the top of the knee. And he did it for both individuals, and he said that nakedness was considered anything to where skin was showing from, from the knee up to the shoulders. If skin was showing, they were considered naked in God's eyes. It's something that I want us to consider because, brethren, when we think about modesty, we think about appropriateness, it's, it's important we understand what the rule is. What's the standard? Who gets to set the standard? I'm just talking to the kids over the last few weeks about God's rules, God's expectations. And if we are to live according to the rules that he sets forth, then can we know if we're pleasing to God? And the answer is yes. <coughs> So, brothers and sisters, God fitted them with coats of skin. The Hebrew word for coat in that passage, as I just said, it indicates a garment that went from the shoulders to the top of the thighs, and God, or to the bottom of the thighs. And God's designer clothing for the uh, covering of mankind included both the same for the man and the woman. And the same thing applied to Adam and Eve as applied to who? Peter. Going back to John chapter 21 that I started with. There's a reason why he wore a tunic. A tunic was like a t-shirt-like garment that had no sleeves, and it went from the shoulders to about mid-calf. And the cloak was a garment that was like a robe that did something similar, but was made of heavier material because it was used as a blanket at night. You see, brethren, as you look at all of this information, if immodesty were only about not causing someone to lust after another, then why, oh why, did Adam and Eve feel shame for their nakedness when there were no human beings to lust after them? Brethren, it has to do with appropriateness. I will propose to you that the last thing that they thought was that God was ever going to lust after them. Let me illustrate something else. Skins and cloaks covering Adam and Eve from their shoulders to their knees was considered modest. And for the situation on hand for that time period, that would have been considered modest. But that same outfit would have been not necessarily modest for today. 
What would happen if I would have rolled up in here today, get ready to preach and teach Bible study with my fig leaves and my coat of skin? <laughs> what would have happened? There would have been some looks. There would have been some laughs. And so I roll up here with my fig leaves and my coat of skin. Brethren, we know that that would not have been what? Appropriate. Because God has never given us a step-by-step -step detailed account of how a Christian is to dress. But he did give us a standard for how we are to dress. And that standard goes back to the coat of skins. Shoulder to the top of the knee. And if you're showing skin that's based from the shoulder or the shoulder to the top of the knee and your skin is showing, it's considered nakedness, inappropriate, and modest in God's eyes. Not your preachers, but in God's standard. That's his standard that he set for all mankind. He gave it to Adam and Eve. It wasn't the Jews, it wasn't the Christian, it was the human race. And so, brethren, that's something that we have to keep in mind. And so, because if we did have to wear, uh, if he did create a step-by-step -step guide, it probably would have looked something very familiar to what we've seen in Jesus' day. And that's because if the Christ himself wore that, you don't think it would have been good enough for us? And so, brothers and sisters, God did not do that to us. Instead, what God had given us, he gave us guidelines. He gave us guidelines for overall righteousness, and he leaves it up to us to accomplish both modesty and appropriateness in the way that we present ourselves as Christians to the world. So ask yourself, brethren, how does a Christian remain modest in an immodest world? Well, first and foremost, we must know God's standard for modesty and for behavior. And second thing we need to know is that we need to understand what are the consequences for immodesty. And the third thing and the last thing is, what, what are we, what is our responsibility with this information? And I'm going to close the lesson down here. I thought I was going to get so much farther than this. Next week's going to be a long lesson. So I just, you know, you got, you got, you got, you know, padded pews. We're, we're, we're already 10 minutes past. And I want you to know that we're going to continue this lesson because we want to know, we already kind of know what the standard is going back to Adam and Eve, but we need to know what are the consequences for dressing immodestly. Are there consequences? And we need to really know, brethren, what is our responsibility as disciples, as Christians, to God and the standard that he sets forward. So, brethren, we're going to pause the lesson here. We're going to pick it up next week because this is such a crucial concept and it's a problem that we have in the church and it's a problem that we have in society. Make no mistake about it. Brethren, if there's anybody here today, maybe you're here today, but you've already been considering the Lord and you're outside of the kingdom. Maybe you've been considering putting on Jesus and baptism, clothing yourself with Christ, and you know you do that in the baptistry. You can be baptized for the remission of your sins. You can receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. If that is your desire, come forward as we stand and sing the song of invitation.